welcome to Let's Meet the Virologist, a podcast about the people behind today's virology headlines, people working to understand viruses and how they affect you. We are talking with students, postdocs, and other virologists so that you can learn who they are and what they do. I am Larissa Thackeray, and I am hosting this podcast from America's Heartland in St. Louis, Missouri. On June 20th, 2022, we talked with Alberto Lopez Munoz, a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He received his master's and PhD from the Autonomous University of Madrid in Spain, where he studied the ability of a herpes simplex virus protein to enhance chemokine activity. Currently, he is studying the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein and its immunomodulatory activity. Thanks for talking with us today. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's, it's great to be here. My name is Alberto Lopez. I'm a molecular biologist, and I'm currently working as a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Jonathan Judel, which is part of the Laboratory of Viral Diseases at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the main NIH campus in Bethesda, Maryland. So I received my master's and PhD from the Universidad Autónoma of Madrid in Spain, where I studied immunomodulation and evolutionary mechanisms of human herpes simplex viruses under the mentorship or guidance of Dr. Antonio Alcamil. And during this predoctoral training or stage, I went abroad twice in order like to perform two research internships and like expose myself like to a more international environment which were part of my PhD program. The first of them was at the Imperial College in, in London, in the United Kingdom. And the second one was actually here at the NIAID in the US. And this is the reason that I'm here investigating now alternative roles of human coronaviruses protein in host immunomodulation. Great. And can you tell us when you, uh, sort of back when, when you were younger, when did you first become interested in science or what sort of started that for you? <laughs> that's that's a funny question. It's gonna sound like first uh, like a bit of a cliche at the beginning, but truth be told that when I was like a still a child or very early in my adolescence, I felt that like vocation that they wanted like to be a scientist. I used to say that I wanted to be a doctor, and people used to say, "Oh, do you want to study medicine?" And I used to say, "No, no, like the real kind of doctor." <laughs> <laughs> so after that, this is why people used to laugh at that. Uh, but after that, when I was like, uh, like in my late uh, years of high school, actually, there was like a uh, small outbreak of like the infectious mononucleosis, which is also known as the Kissing disease, disease uh, which is very contagious and is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. At that point, I didn't know that that was caused by the human herpes virus. But that caught my attention. It was very shocking, like, like to me seeing how most of my like colleagues uh, at that time they were sick for for a couple of weeks and that like kind of like awoke on, on me like that interest in virology and in viruses later when i went to college and i started like to like to know for example uh, about like the 1918 flu or also wrongly so called spanish flu one of the great pandemics you know and how like actually these entities that were called viruses were actually able like to shock like the world in the way that they did and we we also like we we've witnessed that sadly in the last like two years that not like the major wars like in the in the last century were able like to fully stop like the the war activity but the pandemic was what actually like awoke in me as i was saying before like this real interest and like, i understood that maybe it could be like the book, like the thing that I wanted, like to really dedicate my my life, like in terms of like uh, like uh, career and professionally speaking. Cool. And then, can you tell us a little bit about sort of the education system, um, where you're from, and sort of how you get from undergrad to graduate school, and then now into your postdoc? How does that work exactly? Uh, absolutely, it's kind of similar, uh, and actually, uh, like to the U.S., and it's actually well unified uh, within like the, the the European Union. May I should tell you like a little bit about my background and how like I went like to college and how, what was mm -hmm. like my path. So I'm originally from southern Spain, which from a kind of like a non-small region in the southeast corner of the peninsula, which is called Murcia. 
So I went there to college and I studied general biology for three years, including microbiology was my favorite subject, as you can imagine. <laughs> so after that, I moved to Madrid, where I ended up obtaining my bachelor's degree in molecular biology and biotechnology. And the truth is that like being exposed like in a, in, in a bigger city, like to this microbiology network, it allowed me like to actually found a, a proper vi virology lab. And then I joined, as I mentioned before, Antonio's lab as a master's student. With at that at that time, it was a requirement like to be able to access a PhD program. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason that I enrolled first, like in this master program. But after like experiencing like my like myself being being exposed like, to this virology environment for one year, I really liked it. And Antonio offered me like to fully develop that a small project that I started like to do as a master's student, becoming like as, as a, P, a PhD student uh, and trying like to uh, decipher what was going on with the most divergent viral protein between herpes, sim herpes simplex virus type one and type two and how that glycoprotein in the surface of the, the viral particle was actually uh, interacting different, differently in the, or was impacting differently, like the, the viral pathogenesis, or was actually like helping those viruses like to have a preferential neurotropism in, in, in case of like herpes type one, preferential infecting like the, like the, the, the orofacial like area and type two, like the genital area. And that caught my attention and my interest. And I decided like to formally join his lab and trying like to embark in this like a journey of becoming like a real virologist. And this is how it happened. <laughs> Cool, cool. And then can you talk a little bit about what it's like doing your studies and then your postdoc at the NIH as a sort of a more, um, what is it, intramural uh, research place? What is that like being a postdoc, um, a, a researcher there? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, Arisa. So the whole point from me when I when I was a PhD student, I didn't let my PhD my PhD like a, like was close to finish, like to start looking for a postdoc position. What they wanted to do in the meanwhile was trying to compare different systems, you know, in order like to see what was what I was gonna do after my PhD and like a long term if I wanted like to become a, a PI what system was the most suitable at least in my personal opinion like being immersed in so this is what they went like to the uk i had already been in spain and this is what i also came here to the us and it's true that i had an amazing time and i learned a lot in, in the three places that they mentioned but truth be told that as you mentioned being in, in the intramural system at the nih for me was like an eye-opening like experience in terms of at least of funding. On top of that, I gotta say that uh, having met my current supervisor, Dr. Jonathan Judel, was for me like the like the cherry on the top because we I think that we click very well. We liked each other. We understood that we could do like good stuff together. And this is what I finally decided like to like like move forward and do that step. And I'm coming here to the US for for so far three years. And let's see uh, where is the how much it lasts. But I think that I will stick around for a while. <laughs> OK, OK. And then can you tell us then a little bit sort of like, I guess, the big picture of the research that you're doing and then maybe some of the techniques that you use, how you actually do those studies? Absolutely. Well, as I mentioned before, I am very passionate about understanding how viruses are able to mimic the, the human immune system and modulate it during infection. That was what caught my attention from the very beginning. And as I mentioned, during my PhD, I focused on studying the role of this divergent like viral protein between HSV type 1 and type 2, because actually it was the first viral protein described interacting with chemokine, but enhancing their activity, meaning that when this viral protein binds the chemokines, somehow modifies its like a, a structure, allowing or exposing like the, the receptor binding domain like in a better way. And that way, and in this way, it enhances like the, the, the leukocyte recruitment to the infection focus. And that shocked me because you would, you would think, you would guess that the virus wants exactly the opposite 
wants like to avoid or, or delays as much as possible the, the, the recruitment of the immune the immune cells like to the infection focus in order to allow it like to replicate the, like in a, in a better way so that was like what was always like trying like to drive in my like research interest so here uh, actually i i decided to join john's lab in order like to do something different and i was i started actually to uh to study like uh the sources of um pep peptide from influenza a viruses how like different like 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 uh, proteins can contribute with these peptides for mhc class one immunosurveillance uh, that's a that's another story the point was that when COVID hit we were offered like to switch and then i started like to think how could i contribute with my expertise to the, the ongoing pandemic and my reflection was was simple. I did my bibliographic like search, but was simple in this in the sense of what I thought and what I still think is that viruses will have like large uh, double stranded large DNA viruses such as herpes viruses or pox viruses that I'm very like like familiar with, which encode a, a wide repertoire of proteins which are fully dedicated to counteract the immune response. And now we have coronaviruses which are RNA viruses, but they have a much smaller genome, which means by that, that has a more reduced protein, protein coding capacity. So my reflection was perhaps in, this, in, in, in those fewer proteins from the coronavirus family, some of them could be like hiding like an immunomodulatory role that could be playing and we are not aware of it. And that could be, for example, the reason behind, for example, the cytokine storm or that clotting phenomenon that has been described in, 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 in long COVID or severe COVID uh, patients. So we started by doing a, a high throughput screening of interaction between all the major SARS-CoV-2 structural and accessory proteins by BLI, which is actual, which is biolayer interferometry. It's a technology that we can immobilize a viral protein, for example, in a biosensor. We immerse it into a solution containing a cytokine, a human cytokine, and we can see yes or no binding. And after that, we can go further to characterize the kinetics of that interaction to see, to replicate that interaction in other, by other settings. So after doing that, we found that there was only one viral protein, one viral protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which was actually binding a huge subset of human cytokines, which is the nucleocapsid protein. This nucleocapsid protein actually is, is canonically or traditionally described as an intracellular protein. So it was shocking because how, would, how it was possible that that intracellular protein was interacting with components of the immune system that are found extracellular extracellularly or in the in the extracellular like compartment so that was the first challenge that i faced and actually for our surprise we found that all cell lines that were susceptible for SARS-CoV-2 infection were secreting actively secreting in abundant quantities the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein on the cell surface. And we were able to easily and nicely identify this SARS-CoV-2 end protein on the cell surface. And it was even more shocking the fact that we saw that this protein was transferred from donor or infecting cells to surrounding or neighboring cells, which weren't already infected. I, I designed like a like a, a bunch of arrays or assays in order like to make sure that that that, that transference phenomenon was happening that way and that was very cool like to see how like actually those cells that were like nearby and weren't infected yet they were already expressing in trans that nucle that nuclear protein on their cell surface uh what else can i tell you about that uh we also found that this protein as i said is binding the chemokines and actually that interaction at least in vitro means that is causing an inhibition of the induction of migration. So when we have, when we combine chemokines and purified SARS-CoV-2 and protein, we see a decrease or an inhibition in the ability of the chemokine to recruit uh, immune cells to 
to, to, to the infection focus. So that would be at least like the theory, because as I said, this is so far an in vitro approach. We, we are trying like to develop it and to show this in vivo, which is much more challenging as you can imagine. And well, now what, they want, what I'm trying to do is to expand this, not only to SARS-CoV-2, but to other members of like the beta coronavirus family, because my hypothesis is that this is not an isolated phenomenon, since actually it's been described that other RNA viruses, such as influenza virus, vesicular stomatitis virus, measles, respiratory syncytial virus, all of those RNA viruses was described already that they secreted their nucleocalcid proteins on the uh, on the infection uh, context. So those cells which are infected are also expressing and showing cell surface nucleocalcid protein, which I believe that could be like a conserve mechanism. This is purely like hypothetical, could be like a, a conserve mechanism, depending on the virus, obviously, what they would like be like modulating or praying. Uh, but could be something conserved in terms of like uh, immunomodulation at the earliest stages of the infection. <laughs> That's very broad, but this is something you know that I'm trying like to uh, polish as uh, my like own personal like uh, project for if I want like to become if I decide to go to become a PI. <laughs> How would you be able to be di distinguished that this is sort of like a specific um, effect of the infection and not more like sort of a side effect that there's so much N protein being generated? That's a, a, an excellent, but also like a challenging question. <laughs> I'm gonna try to address it in the best way possible. As you well said, it is the most abundant viral protein during coronavirus infections. So uh, at least we know that those cells that are actively secreting the N protein are alive. And I was very rigorous controlling always that the viability of the cells that they were analyzing because I, I, you know, I, we were always afraid that if we were like dying and they were releasing all the intracellular contact, that was one of the way for having those huge amounts. So in, in most of the assays, at least 95 or 98 percent of the cells were alive, which made me feel confident about the fact that it was an actual an active release. Also, I can tell you that with a relatively low MOI multiplicity of infection, around one, one PFU per, uh, per cell, as early as eight hours post-infections to 12 hours post-infection, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, we were able to actively, like, to properly detect by flow cytometry uh, and protein on the cell surface of these infected cells, but not a spike, for example. So I understood that that was another like uh, like evidence to believe that even if like it is being actively or hugely like uh, like synthesized and secreted, it must be like an active process that somehow is is getting there. We don't know so far how is actually this secretion happening. We have like some uh, evidence showing that. This is unpublished that that this not is not going uh, outside through the canonical secretory pathway, so it must be going through a, a one of those non-canonical pathway. So that will require more time for me, like to be able like to contribute or decipher exactly what is going on on, on those terms. But I think that this is very exciting, like for me, exciting like for me to see all of these things happening, and I think that it has like a. It could, it may have like a like a, a biological relevance. We need to to try to find the proper models, to try to find like the proper collaborators, like to address these things. But I think that at least it, it keeps me like um, like motivated, like to keep going every day to the lab and like yeah. infecting cells and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sort of reminds me maybe of like um, the flavivirus NS1. I kind of wonder if it it's having some. Uh, effect on sort of distal tissues or, you know, blood brain barrier or GI barrier or some other things. Uh, absolutely. Like commenting on that, actually, I remember a couple of papers that were particularly revealing to me when I was like writing my discussion for, for the paper. Uh, there is a, there is one paper in which uh, like the authors were able like to like to get uh, some post-mortem biopsies from lungs. From some patients, uh, and they found that th there were there there was no sign of RNA from the virus, neither 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 signs from other viral proteins, but 
there was there were huge amounts of nucleoprotein still on those biopsies. I think that it was like 14 or 20 days post, uh, post-mortem or something like that. Another paper, I remember also that they sh- the author showed that for four months after those patients were uh, cons- were test- were testing negative for SARS-CoV-2 infection, they got some biopsies from the GI tract and they were able to identify and protein also on those uh, on those biopsies at different levels of the GI tract, which was, which was like very revealing to me at least, you know, like like wondering what is that M protein doing there four months after the right. infection. Again, I think that there is like a, a field that you know it will it will be cool, like like keep digging into it, like trying to see what we can find. So, but yeah, absolutely agree with you with your comment that this is could be like one of those proteins that is doing much more than was previously thought. Right, right. Great. Very interesting. And um, this paper that you've talked about, has this been submitted uh, for, uh, or has it been accepted? Is it out there or? I, I am very happy to tell you that it was last week accepted in Science Advances. So it will be come out, uh, it will be out soon. Oh, so yeah, okay. but but so far you can you can check out the everybody can check out the the preprint version that we have in BioArchive, which is there and is and it's pretty much the the, the the final version that we are gonna publish with a couple of more like experiments in the final version. Uh, but yes, so yeah, great, great. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Um, so I guess then to just finish it up, what what has been sort of the last two years like for you? So being in another country in the middle of a pandemic, uh, all of the sort of turmoil and, you know, all the stuff that we've been going through, what's that been like for you? Oof, what a question. Now that I, that I like turn my head back and I reflect on like the, the last two and a half years, it, it, it's been, it's been challenging, but also a, a golden opportunity for my career. And this is how I understood it. Because obviously finding myself, this is how I saw it, at the right place on the right time. That was for me, you know, like like a revelation, and I and I try like to understand that as a way like to keep myself motivated, and try like to do my best, and this was exactly what what I tried to do. I gotta say also that I, I I gotta thank like all the support from my supervisor, from John, John Judel. It, it's been uh, it's, uh, I mean I'm speechless because he provided us all the guidance, all the resources, all the reagents, everything that we needed during the, the, the actual like worst time of the pandemic. And that was what helped me like to be able like to develop like the whole story that I just was telling you a little bit about before. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, being here where the BRC, the, Varsi, the Vaccine Research Center, which is like a, a building where the Moderna vaccine was like designed and, and then obviously synthesized by them. Being able like to be a, a first row witness of the whole process for me was a, like a one in a life, you know, like a time like experiences. Even that much that encouraged me to join the Moderna like, clinical trial and phase three. So I received my COVID shot in August, 2020 in under experimental conditions. Obviously I was fully blinded but I was pretty confident that I had got the, the vaccine because that uh, night I didn't sleep well at all. <laughs> and I was like uh, experiencing some fever and some chills, but it was super cool. Like being able like to also like, uh, like seeing like the whole process happening from, you know, like the actual design of the vaccine, passing through all the protocols, the security protocols up, uh, until like receiving the, the job on my, on my shoulder. That was super cool. And that was also like a positive, um, like a, a positive, a very positive thing to me. Uh, as a downside, which I want to comment also on that too. Uh, as I said, my I'm originally from Spain, so my family is there, and I wasn't able to go to see them for two years. I knew that they were fine, and they they were fine actually. Like the whole like during the whole like COVID, the the worst time of the COVID pandemic. So that at least helped me like to like to keep going, and I was able like to go back and, and visit them last year in July after two years. So we had an amazing time. We gathered the whole family and we celebrated. That I was back, so that was super cool, but also challenging. Made me appreciate much more, you know, like like 
my family and what are like the important things if, in life if you want to say yeah being like a bit like a philosophical now but this is true i think that helps you like to like to reframe some things in a in a better way and i could tell you more stories that happened to me during the covid time like when i was like flying back in the middle of the pandemic from um detroit to back to dc and I was in a flight, uh, one of like the major airlines in the US, and like the flight attendant, he noticed that my last name was the same one as uh, his grandmother. Uh, he came by like to like to say hi to me. So then we stopped talking, and when I told him, he asked me what I was doing uh, like uh, like for a living, and I told him he was very impressed and very grateful like for the service that I was doing <laughs> for the country in his words. Up to the point that when the plane landed, uh, the whole crew, the whole airplane crew, including the the captain, they all thanked me, and it was you know it was very encouraging. That that had never happened to me in the past. Actually, like feeling you know like the true appreciation of a society for for you that are a scientist, a virologist. That had never happened to me, and that was one of the greatest experiences in my life. Seriously, that had like like tell me like to reflect on the fact that maybe this is their real career that they want to like fully dedicate my life from now on <laughs> yep cool cool great well it's been nice talking with you and we look forward to hearing um about your work uh, reading your paper um and i you were saying that you're not able to attend asb in person but you will be attending online so you can catch up on sort of the latest virology and we hope to see you in person maybe next year. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure, Larissa. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me today. This has been Let's Meet the Virologist, a podcast about people who study viruses. This is your host, Larissa Thackray, and thanks for listening. You can find us on Google, Apple, Amazon Music, and other podcast providers or at lmtv.podbean.com. Thank you.